Now, I had two stints here. Right. From 56 to 60, I was the program director. You probably remember that as a kid. I was running the camp and the group work stuff in the center. And then I left, and then I went to Toronto for three years. I was working with the United Jewish Appeal. And then when Lou Kerman left, something happened that never happens to a professional. <laughs> they remembered me and invited me back. I mean, this does, doesn't happen. So I came back in 63. Right. So you know, if you they, could do the following, Bill, because nobody could do it better than you, believe me. If you could just um, help to give us a sense of how the community was, was organized. I mean, whether it had to do with uh, the Jewish Community Center, whether there were other organizations. If you could talk about maybe some of the more prominent personalities, you know, the characters of this community who helped to shape it, we would do as little interfering as possible uh, because when the interview was done on a tape cassette, then you can more easily edit out what you don't want. Here, um, we'll guide you, but for the most part, we're going to rely on your recollections and your reconstruction. Well, I'll, I'll try hard, Bill, but you know, with recollections, sometimes you don't remember everything you want to remember. Well, I was, uh, I was really lucky to come in here because I'm a social group worker. So I, I stepped into a place where they cared about group work. Now, I, the, Lou Kerman, you know, he was a good job, he was a good administrator, but I think the one who really set this up was Manny Batchaw. Does that name mean anything to you? Montreal guy. Who's Lou Kerman? I don't know who that is. Well, Manny Batchaw uh, came here in 19, what? About 1950, I guess. But he was one of the top professionals. Good Montreal boy, what do you expect? Um, and he came in here when Ken Sobel was active. And he and Ken were separable. They worked very hard. Marvin was involved in those years too. Um, he would remember Manny Batch, I'm sure. Um, Ken Sobel means something to you. He was a big, uh, big mucker in this community. But what Manny Matchow was able to do was to set up a solid foundation. He was a, a tremendous leader. And uh, he got, you know, he got programs going. Well, as a matter of 1950, the building was completed at, at Delaware. That was before I got here. So Manny must have come in here late 47 or 48 because he was responsible for raising the funds and making and getting that building set up. That's right. As a matter of fact, there was a plaque for Manny, and uh, you maybe remember it, and uh, Ken Sobel in the library of at uh, Sanford in Delaware. Um, you know, it's interesting. We put up plaques. You know what happened? Then they knocked the building down. I don't know whatever happened, would have happened to that plaque. So, so Manny did the fundraising and set up the program. And uh, the guy was so good. <laughs> you know, his next job was with the National Jewish Welfare Board in New York City, where he was one of the top leaders in the National Jewish Welfare Board you know, across the world, not just the United States. So that's the kind of a guy you had with Manny Batcha. He's back in Montreal now, you know. He must be about 90, I think. He's still going strong. He's doing some work with the Israel Fund, I think. So maybe that, that's the beginning of me coming in because when I came in, in, it's just an interesting thing. When I was a student at the School of Social Work, I did my uh, field work in my last year at the um, Holy Blossom Temple, and which was a real going place. A guy by the name of Heinz Warshauer, I don't know if that name is anything. But he got me to take my group of kids to Hamilton. Why? To see what a new building looks like. Hamilton was so proud of that building. This was in 1950. And uh, I remember coming with the kids. And uh, there was a Hamilton guy 
whose name might mean something to you, Morris Stein. Does that mean anything Max to you? Max Stein? Not Max. No, no, Max. I can tell you about later. Max was my president for a good minute. No, this was a younger guy. He, he was a social worker, and he, he was working here. He hadn't, he, he hadn't graduated yet, but he was working as a, as a group worker. And I remember he came, he was a Hamilton guy, he's in uh, Seattle, Washington, no, no, Houston, Texas. Uh, one of the big guys in the Federation field, the former Hamilton boy. Anyways, that was in 1950, and uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen in your life. 1956, I find myself as a staff member here. My title at that time was uh, Director of Activities, which meant I was really the program director. All age groups, from nursery to golden age, it all fell under my jurisdiction. And um, we, we had some very good programs going. Do you remember some of them, Wendy? Any of the programs? Or did you just come uh, to camp? And yeah, I, I went to Tomatora. Yeah, well, the Tomatora in those days was on the second floor, right. right? And my office was on the second floor. So the teachers were always coming in. It said group work on my office, and I shared that with Sam Brownstone. And Max Rotman, who was supposed to be downstairs, was always in my office. So we, we had a tremendous camaraderie, the three of us. Matter of fact, if you go into the new building, I see, I, I was surprised. I went in there one day and the three of us are there in a picture. Mm -hmm. It was a very close relationship. I want to talk about that later, about Max. Um, so we, um, we developed a group work program uh, and we developed a particularly good adult activities program. As Norman Bennett's mother was the chairperson. What was her first name? Uh, uh, Bennett. Chairman something Norman Bennett. Norman. It's crazy that I can't remember her yeah. first name. Um, she was Irving Zucker's sister. Yeah. And she was a dynamo. So I was lucky there. I was also lucky with my uh, camp chair. I also directed the camp, who was uh, Dorothy Schechter. Remember Dorothy Schechter? Terry's aunt, yeah. See, I was so lucky. These were very good people. Uh, Dorothy was the uh, camp chairperson. You know, we used to operate, we used to operate out of the building. And that particular summer, the summer of 57, was just like this, you know, hot, humid. And we were in a building, there was no air conditioning in those days. So what did we do? Max, uh, was like me, a pretty good scrounger. We scrounged every swimming pool in this town. It was swimming almost every day. We'd go to Parkdale Community Center, it was a big pool, and people's houses. There was a guy out in Ancaster. Now, yeah, this wasn't a Jewish guy. <laughs> this was a non-Jew that Max, Max knew everybody. And uh, we had his pool. And I think we, I think that one of the Goldblatt's, Marvin's brother, Hobby had a pool. Hobby had a pool. That's right. So, as a matter of fact, when when uh, when Dorothy stepped down, Hobby became the chairman of the uh, camp. He was great too. But that was, that was my last year when he took over, and then he he just stayed there. He was very good. So we had all these swimming pools. So it didn't matter if it was so bloody hot and there was no air conditioning, and the program was great. I remember one, the final program in that particular year, I think I wrote it up somewhere. Uh, we, we celebrate the State of Israel. The State of Israel wasn't that old in those days. And uh, Theodore Herzl, I remember, came alive that day. <laughs> one of the kids had a nice beard. He, looked at he actually looked like Theodore Herzl. It was good Jewish content programming, you know. Uh, but Max, knowing everybody too, we had all kinds of characters. There was a wrestler. All the wrestlers used to come to our place. My father, who loved wrestling, and I could never get him out of it, I used to say to him at his house, Pa, you know, it's fixed, that, which I stopped after a while. He was enjoying it so much. Why should I ruin his enjoyment? But they, they used to rehearse in our center. 
So it was on a Sunday, my father had me, I say, come on, Pa, I'll show you that you're aggressive. They're going through their act, you know. He said, you see that, you say that's fake? You could see the guy, he just didn't want to believe it was. Who were the Jewish wrestlers? Laskin, there was a guy by the name of Laskin, Jack Laskin. Uh, the guy was good. His mother was Sarah. His mother was Sarah. No, it was, or that was his aunt. Okay. I think Sarah was okay. his aunt. The Laskins were a very close-knit family. One of them just died in Toronto the other day. Morris, Morris Laskin. I have a photograph of Max Rotman and a bunch of Jewish wrestlers on Delaware Avenue, all yeah, well, they, up in a... Yeah, well, they loved the guy. Yeah. You know, they used to come in, not only the wrestlers, the football players used to come in too. I can't remember, but one of the finest uh, Tiger Cat players, his locker was right beside mine. So I always knew what was going on. The, the relationship with these guys was very close. But that's how Max and Sam and I, we worked on the basis of relationships, I think, as I look back on it. Um, so those, those were good days. And the kids on Sundays used to have a great time. Uh, there were some friendship groups, but for the most part, we broke it up into interest groups, whether, whether it was uh, some sports event or, or drawing or arts and crafts or uh, something like that. So you would go to Talmatora and then you would stay for the whole day and do activities after Talmatora? Yeah, that's a lot of kids did that. But Talmatora, I remember, was also on a Thursday or? It was three times a week. Three times a week. <coughs> But all the teachers used to congregate in my, uh, in my office. There was a lady, um, Croce, Sylvia, Sil Sylvia Croce, do you remember her? Yeah. Yeah, she always had problems <laughs> with the principal. She was an excellent teacher. And she loved the kids. But, uh, you know, I didn't have anything else to do. So she'd come in and give me all her problems that she was having. So, but she was a good teacher. So from 56 to 60, lots of activities. The camp, the camps ran well all those years with Dorothy at Schechter as president and then with Abby coming in. Um, the programming was good. We, we even had, eventually, we, we had, um, what's his name? Big guy, he gave us a piece of land for camp. You know what I'm talking about? No. Uh, it's out in Dundas. He gave us a piece of land in Dundas for the, for the camp. So now we had a piece of land. And uh, we programmed out there, but, but that, was, that was later. And what else can I tell you about those early years, 56 to 60? Well, oh, the, I should tell you, the council. Yeah, talk about the council. The Council of Jewish Organizations was non -parel. You know, whenever I went to a conference, I'd have to sit down with the pro and say, how do you set up this council? This was Manny Banchat's work. Now, the Council of Jewish Organizations was composed of representatives from everything in this town whether it was Hadassah, or whether it was the Pioneer Women, or uh, B'nai B'rith, uh, and the, um, the shuls all had representatives. So the council would have about, uh, about 40 people at some of those meetings. So it was very democratic. Everybody could speak up, and they did. Now, from the council, then you, you represented an executive. And the executive met once a week. People can't believe that when I tell them. Every week we would have a packed house of executive members who, um, who spoke up. You, you had leadership really coming up. Bill Morris was one of my presidents one year. After he was finished president, I made him chairman of the welfare fund. So he had. I really wore six or seven different hats in that job. I'm not complaining, you know, it's the best experience I ever had in social work. But, uh, you know, I worked with the executive 
fortunately, I had good secretaries. So, you know, we always did minutes ready for the meeting, and I put their things in books. God forbid if one of the guys, I remember, I think it was Jack Schechter, couldn't find his book one meeting. He was very upset. You know. <laughs> but the books would all be ready with the minutes that uh, go through them. And uh, it, it, it ran like clockwork. What were the big issues of the day in those days? <clears throat> That's a good question. The big issue, well, the issue that became eventually was uh, funding. Well, was to, I remember the, one of the very first meetings where I came in. Doctor, uh, geez, he used to live on. Uh, he lived. He sold his house to Link Alexander. You know who I'm talking to. He was a Levine, Maury Levine. That name mean, doesn't mean anything to you. Okay, we're having a meeting. We're talking about. Um, the advent of the day school, because at that time, you know, it, it was just a baby starting up. I think they had about 22 students at the time when somebody spoke up and asked. What year are you talking about? Oh, I'm talking about, uh, well, I'm talking about later, but it's, it doesn't matter. It's, it, it was, but I'm talking about 1964, I think. Okay. That's when I came back. Mm -hmm. Um, and this fellow came up asking for consideration of allocation for the uh, day school, which was an infant at the time. It had just got going. I remember more Levine standing up said, if one penny of my money goes to that day school, count me out. You know, he's not going to give anything. And I, I'm not. This is nothing to do with Maury. I was, it's just symbolic of the feelings. It was very, uh, you know, it was in those days, it was maybe 70, 30 against funding the day school. So Rabbi Green here had that one hell of a job, to, you know, as well. he, the guy's a leader, he's a natural leader. Um, so you asked me some, what was some of the, this became a very big issue, the day school, well, the whole day school. And it didn't, it wasn't only an issue in Hamilton. If you look at the history of federations, it was right across the board. Every executive director, every executive, every president, this became, and you know what, it hasn't ended. It's, it's still, you go to Toronto a meeting, you can mistake it because that's all they would aside from Israel. Israel is the whole thing, all of its own. But for local needs. But that cuts it to Israel needs too, and that's where you really get the fight. And we had that fight here too, because you had the pro-Israelites, like myself, to tell you the truth, um, and then you had the, uh, the ones who wanted the money for education. So that, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but there were other issues, like Shalom really started at one of our meetings. Why do I say that? Shalom Village, I'm talking about. Um, must have been about 1966. What was the director's name, that wonderful lady? Uh, Sheila Berman? Sheila. I'm sitting just like we're sitting in my office one day, knock on the door. It's Sheila, she comes in, sat down. Um, just came from England, looking for work. Well, you know, what do you do? He says, well, I work with older people. Well, you know, life is full of coincidences. We were really just starting our seniors program at that time. And uh, I took around for part-time we really didn't have a budget for a seniors program. We're just getting started, and she came on. It was like a piece of gold falling in my lap. I was, you know, I was very lucky as I look back with with people. And she got a program going, which, well, the need was there. You know, that people were living longer and so on. And eventually, there was a house next door. And if you remember, when the right on the corner. Gladstone, is that the name of the street? We bought that house. You're talking about issues. There was a whole thing around purchasing that house, you can imagine. 
and that became the senior's house. This is really the beginning of Shalom Village. As a matter of fact, um, when there was a anniversary, Sheila was still on staff. She was kind enough to invite me to, I think it took place in here, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the reunion. Um, so we, Shalom Village, you can trace that back to the Seniors Hamilton Council. Seniors lived in that home? On, at the corner? No, no, no. That was a recreation center. Okay. They had their meetings, everything. But that, that was the beginning, really, of Shalom Village. On a Sunday afternoon, Bill, when the JCC was on Delaware, that was a very happening place, was it oh, not? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's the program, I say, where we had all kinds of programs going. Um, club programs. There were a few club groups. But here, too, I was very fortunate to have tremendous club leaders. Harold Goldblatt was very good. Isabel Feynman, Isabel Strub. Um, these were sort of natural kids who were good natural leaders. She was born here, I Isabel Strub? Isabel Feynman. Yeah, the Feynmans were Hamiltonians. You don't remember that name, eh? No. Where does Max Rotman fit into the picture? Max was a phys ed director, but he was more than a phys ed director. Can you talk about Max Rotman a bit? Well, Max Rotman was, <laughs> was one of these guys that was always at the right place at the right time. I don't know how he did it. Terrific instincts. And if you see photographs of, um, uh, of Max with the kids, you'll always see them up, either up front with the kids or he's at the back with the kids up the front. Got some good camp pictures of that someplace. He was a natural. He had done a lot of uh, volunteer work with baseball teams, I think, if I remember correctly, or in basketball teams even more so. If you speak to guys like Cuppy Cats, First thing he's going to talk about is Max Rotman. He was Cuppy's coach. And uh, you see, he was the kind of a guy like, my son is autistic, you know. But Max always made sure he was on the floor. I mean, all the guys would be up at that end, and he'd still be down at this end. I mean, it would take him off eventually, but he'd, but this is the kind of guy Max was. He was a natural born social worker, really, who had a tremendous feeling for people. And he was like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. You know, you, the kids, they follow him all over the place. That was Max Rotman. Just while around Max Rotman, it's not a gripe, but when Max died, which was a shocker, because I think he was only 54 at the time, trying to figure out in my own mind, what can we do to honor this guy? And I was walking along uh, Main Street opposite the city hall and I, it just hit me. I wanted to see uh, Vic, uh, who, was, who was the mayor at that time. We had a very good relationship with him. And I, he knew Max very well and I said, it'd be nice if the city did something together with us. And it was at that time we set up the Max Rotman Humanitarian Youth Award. Those words came out of my mouth while I was talking to Vic. And, uh, and, and that's how it started. Now, what happened in the interim is that uh, when Max, you see, when Max died, he, uh, prior to that, he had been co-director with Al Hirsch. Do you remember Al Hirsch? They were co-camp directors. Max's wife keep, kept getting at me, Bill, Max can't do this anymore. He's working too hard, which I knew because I noticed that shortness of breath. He was a heavy smoker too. So I took him off as co-camp director. Um, I tried to explain why, but <laughs> Even his wife was mad at me at the time because you can't win in these kinds of situations. But the only reason I raise this now is that 
And it's ironic because when the Max Rothman Humanitarian Youth Award is presented every year now, maybe I've been asked to be there. I think once I was a speaker, once or twice. And we're going back now to 19, what, 69, I think it was when Max died. So, you know, it's a long time ago. But um, I certainly have some feelings about that. Now, I have talked to <coughs> a young lawyer, Katz. Howard. Howard, who's been acting. One year, I think you remembered, but hmm. I don't know why these things happen. These are little things. This is a small community, relatively small speaking. Community. Yeah. But the sense that comes through is that it was a very well organized community. Well, I like to think my best friend was the community. <laughs> You know, aside from this incident that happened, uh, you know, when Max died, and, you know, it was very hard for me to, for somebody to say, you know, like, you killed the guy because you took him away from that job, uh, which is, you know, so damned ridiculous. But um, these things happen. Uh, Were there, uh intense politics in the community as, as they're probably, I mean. Only around the issue of the day school. And that school. disappeared as soon as the day school was completely accepted in total. It vanished. I mean, look at it today. <laughs> but the, the beginning is that I brought in a particularly good chairman uh, Jewish education also came under my venue because, because his name was Frankel. Maybe you remember him at McMaster. He Saul. was Saul. Do you know Saul? Yeah. Well, I got Saul, who was a secular Jew, but had a lot to do with uh, with education, to be chairman of my education committee. Okay. These are the kind of relationships we had. Oh, could you get a better guy than Saul Frankel? And although he was a secular Jew, just like we're talking about some of these other intellectuals, that guy was phenomenal. I mean, he didn't, he wouldn't come on like this guy I'm telling you about, it's that one penny goes. He could see that that's the direction that the Jewish people were going in. And this guy, Saul Frankel, when he got up and talked, people listened. He was the top one of the top men at the McMaster, right? When he was there. He was the dean of social sciences. He was on my uh, executive committee. These are the kind of guys that were on my executive Marjorie Baskin was an active member of my executive committee. Tell me about Marjorie on your executive committee. Well, Marjorie had a tough time with these guys. As a matter of fact, a terrible thing happened uh, one year in that we had an election and I, the dice were loaded against Marjorie. I didn't even know it. I was too stupid to know what was going on. But um, usually we didn't have an election. It would usually be by acclamation. But that particular year, uh, again, it had to do with Jewish education because Marjorie was not pro-day school. She wasn't against Jewish education, but she was not against, she was not pro-day school. So it, without me knowing, um, Rabbi Green, I hope this is not taped too much, the, the, there was one of the staff members at the day school. I guess he was the principal, the principal of the day school, who was a uh, kind of guy who, you know, people liked him. And his name was proposed to be an executive, so we had an election. Who gets defeated? Marjorie Baskin. And this principal at the day school, he's on the executive, and Marjorie's out. But it all had to do with the day school, basically. I was just saying that Marjorie, Marjorie was voted out one year, and I hope that Rabbi Green doesn't watch this, but I think he engineered this because she was anti-day school. <coughs> she wasn't anti-Jewish education. No. So they proposed the principal of the day, so he was a hell of a nice guy, I can't remember his name. I think he's living in Israel now. And uh, he, he, he was elected. What year was that? 
That would have been 1970, I think. Maybe 71. So that was an interesting, you're asking me about Marjorie. But when Marjorie was at a meeting, it was always interesting. You know, she was a meeting, meeting person. She's the kind of person that you, you, you pray to have at a meeting, but she always, things were always percolating. And a lot of people were opposed to her, but they always respected her intelligence, which was very high. You, you uh, also remember the different rabbis oh, yeah. that, uh, that, that were in Hamilton. And yeah, well, I remember Lichtiger very well because we lived uh, almost next door to each other in John Street South. Well, also his office was down the hall. Remember where Rabbi Lichtiger? No. Do you remember where my office was on the second floor as you came in? He was down the hall. He was the rabbi of what? He, the Talmud Torah. He was rabbi of the Talmud Torah. Well, who's the rabbi of Beth Jacob when you come in? When I came in in 1956, that was a rabbi Simon, I think. Does that name mean anything to you? You remember him? Yeah, well, you were Beth Jacobites, right? Yeah, and then in 1967, Rabbi Silverman came. I, I remember the day he came in. No, he, 57? 67. 67, right. But he must have been preceded by Wiener. No, Rab Wiener came. No, Wiener. Oh, that's right. Wiener yeah, he was preceded. Yeah, when right. Wiener left, he came in. Did you know Wiener? No, but he wrote, I believe, Herbert Wiener. Was Eugene Wiener. Eugene, Eugene. Wiener. Eugene. No, then, no, no this was Eugene Wiener. I, I know yeah. who you're talking about. No, this was Eugene Wiener. He also had a big impact on the teenagers. At the Very big impact. He took them to Israel. He took them to Israel. My sister went on a boat. It was a big deal. Oh, yeah. He had a terrific trip. You know, finance that trip was Ken Sobel. Really? Without Ken Sobel, there was no trip. He financed the whole thing. That's the kind he, of guy Ken was. He was big because he had marched in Selma with Martin Luther King. That's so right. He was really big into civil Yeah, and I was supposed to go with him, but I chickened out. Well, I chickened out. I, I just couldn't get away. But he said, Bill, you're going with me. And I remember Max Stein's face when he told him was he left on a Shabbos. He had to get down his song. And uh, Max says, well, you can't go. He was, it's Shabbos. Not that Max was that religious, but he, deep down he was a religious guy. He was president of Beth Jacob for a number of years. He became my president. And we were, I was, just happened to be at shul that day. Uh, and uh, Eugene said, Bill, you come with me. Jeez, I, I was dying to go. I just couldn't get away well you know what now when I look back you can do any darn thing you want to if you really want to do it I like to think I really wanted to do it but <laughs> you know that I have seen uh, shots of Rabbi Wiener in that in that march really in the front row yeah he I I don't think he's holding on to uh, Martin Luther King's arm. Maybe he is. Heschel. Heschel was holding on to Martin Luther King. Is it Heschel that's holding on? Yeah. So he, he had to travel on the Shabbos too. So you see, yeah. you can make allowances. And yeah. there's certain, certain. The thing I remember about uh, uh, Rabbi Heschel was a uh, conference of uh, United Jewish Welfare Fund people. It was in Montreal, as a matter of fact. And he gets up, there must have been a thousand people in the audience. He says, I, I, I could sum this up in, in two words for you and you can all go home. So he, well, what's that? He says, Sis Schlecht. <laughs> he said, Y'all yeah, want to go home now? It's bad. Things are bad. <laughs> That's a, he had a great sense of humor, Heschel. Those conferences were something else we'd go now, over here. Now, I understand uh, Max Rotman's position. I think I understand your position. What was Sam Brownstone's Sam position? was my associate. And um, he worked with the young, he was very good with the older teenagers and young adults. They loved the guy. A handsome guy. You know? uh, and I had a terrific staff. You know, I had people who could relate like mad. So who succeeded you? Who succeeded me? Sam Seufer. Ah, got it. Good guy. Got it. 
He came up from, uh, where did he come from, Indiana? He came up San, San something, I can't remember. The crazy thing was, when he took that job where he came from, I was interested in the job that he took down there, but he got it. <laughs> he came up here and replaced me. What was the position? What was your title the second time around? Executive Director of the Hamilton Council of Jewish Organizations. Which job I wore seven hats. <laughs> but you know what? The best job I ever had. You know, I miss Hamilton. There's something about I found in times of joy and times of tragedy, it was one community. I don't know if you find it that way. Can it's you give a, some examples? This doesn't exist in Toronto. Can you give some examples of that? Sure, I'll give you a perfect example. When I came back in 1963, I was supposed to start working September the 1st, 1963. Now, I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I'm going to give you straight facts. <coughs> My wife died August the 31st. So I was sitting shiver the day I was supposed to start that job. But you know, I was too dumb even to know what was going on because when I came to my first executive <laughs> meeting, which was you know, ordinarily just another meeting, I gave a report and everybody stood up and applauded. Now, they weren't applauding that bloody report. But it, it took me about 10 years to realize when I thought back on it. They were applauding me. I can't give you a better example than that. These people were feeling. They wanted to make sure I was OK. That's nice. It's a good story. That's why I loved Hamilton so much. And uh, my son, Hirsch, who you know, you know, he was accepted completely. He's got some real problems. No problem. Times of joy, you know, sometimes I could go to three bar mitzvahs in one day. You know, afternoon, night, or the next day, or weddings. I was invited to all of them. I don't think I missed a wedding or a bar mitzvah. Yeah, you're not going to get that in Toronto. Toronto doesn't have one Jewish community. It's got a hundred Jewish communities in different places. There's no such thing. Federation tries to say, ah, uh, we're already good. It's not that well. Not, not like here. It's too big. I'm not criticizing anybody or anything. It's just the way it is. Hamilton has remained small. I don't think you have 5,000 Jewish people here today. You've got 4,700. That's what we always had. 4,700 was the top one we reached. So just keep it that way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. It's very, very good, by the way.